thank you for being here. And thank you especially to our guest, Commissioner Nuri Turkel, for being here with us. What a treat it is for us to have him. Commissioner Turkel is the first US educated Uyghur American lawyer, foreign policy expert, and human rights advocate. He was born, as we'll talk about more today, in a re-education camp at the height of China's tumultuous cultural revolution. And he spent the first several months of his life in detention with his mother. He came to the United States in 1995 as a student and was later granted asylum by the US government. Since June of 2022, Nuri has served as the chair of the US Commission on International Religious Freedom. He's been reappointed by Speaker of the House, Representative Nancy Pelosi, in May of 2022 for another two-year term. I've seen how Commissioner Turkel is really effective at working across party lines and reminding people how religious liberty is not a partisan issue, it's not a political issue, it's something that is core to what it just means to be human. Gary Turkel was named as one of the Times 100 most influential people in the world, and in May 2021, he was named on Fortune's list of the world's 50 greatest leaders. He received his MA in International Relations and a JD from the American University in Washington, DC. As an attorney, he specializes in regulatory compliance, federal investigation enforcement, anti-bribery, legislative advocacy, and immigration. In addition to his professional career, he has devoted his time and his energy to promoting Uyghur human rights and supporting American and universal democratic norms. Nuri is a respected opinion leader and a foreign policy expert primarily focusing on diplomatic, economic, and national security issues involving China, Central Asia, and Turkey. He's a senior fellow at the Huston Institute and a member on the Council of Foreign Relations. I've heard Nuri say before that he works something like five jobs, and he's a, a very involved husband and father, has two beautiful children. I have no idea how Nuri gets any sleep at night, and I know he doesn't get much because of how much he cares about these issues. Nuri, um, not only that, was, but in 2021, something of particular significance for us here at Notre Dame, Nuri was the first recipient of our annual Notre Dame Prize for Religious Liberty that is awarded by our Religious Liberty Initiative that has been spearheaded by Dean Marcus Cole, who we're lucky to have with us today. He is also working with our Religious Liberty Clinic students on an amicus brief in Argentina, advocating for rights of Uyghurs in China. Nuri is a courageous champion for religious freedom, often at great personal sacrifice to himself. I'm very lucky to count Nuri as a dear friend, and we're so lucky to have him with us here at Notre Dame. Please join me in welcoming him. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Thank you. Um, if, I, if I may, I'd uh, like to begin by thanking Notre Dame Law School, our Religious Liberty Initiative, for providing me not only the platform, but all the courage and support. Uh, I'm particularly grateful to uh, Dean Cole standing on the back, and also an amazing team that you're leading um, at the Religious Liberty Initiative. And I'm profoundly grateful to Stephanie. Uh, I don't know what I have done to deserve your support. Uh, this is the second time, by the way, that Stephanie and uh, Dean Cole is organizing book events for me. The first one is in London, and this is the second one. As introduced, I am currently um, serving as the chair in the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, but I'm speaking in my personal capacity today, even though uh, the policy discussions that I will be uh, having with you is the same position as the um, uh, USERFs, uh, uh, including uh, advocating for the U.S. government to formally recognize atrocities committed against Uyghurs and Rohingya Muslims as genocide and all the other legislative initiatives that we supported. Um, thank you very much. Thank you again for hosting me again. Well, Nuri, let's get started talking about this fantastic book you've written, um, No Escape, The True Story of China's Genocide of the Uyghurs. Maybe very first, if you could just provide the students with some background information. Uh, for a student who's never heard of a Uyghur before and doesn't have a lot of familiarity just with the whole geopolitical context, can you provide just a quick snapshot to help them understand what, what's going on, who, who are these people, why is China so threatened by them? Um, I used to say about five years ago when I was asked who the Uyghurs are, I tried to explain in the simplest term 
by saying things like the Uyghurs are the other Tibetans that you have never heard of. <laughs> um, and, and now because of the ongoing genocide that is in its disturbingly uh, sixth year, I've been telling people that uh, this is the people that have been subject to genocide and crimes against humanity in a broad light in communist China. The Uyghur people, uh, ethnically Turkic, um, uh, which means that uh, the, the Uyghurs share cultural, historical, linguistic ties with that of the people in Eurasia continent. That includes Cossacks, Kyrgyz, Uzbek, uh, including uh, Tatars in today's uh, Ukraine, uh, Ukraine, and also uh, Turks in Anatolia, or modern Turkey. Uh, Uyghur people live in this uh, <coughs> massive land uh, that China calls Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region, that Uyghurs call East Turkestan, which is in the heartland of Central Asia. Uh, just to give you a perspective, uh, the Uyghur homeland makes one-sixth of the China proper. It's about four times the size of uh, California, the size of Alaska, the size of Western Europe. It sits in large natural resources, uh, gas, uh, agricultural products, and now the cotton, which we'll talk a little bit. Um, and also it is a get gateway to Eurasian market for the to, to Chinese state. Uh, this is part of reason that uh, China, Chinese leadership uh, decided to completely uh, silent, silence the population through this massive uh, uh, modern scale concentration camps and also collective punishment to uh, lock, the, lock up the Uyghurs in the camps uh, and also uh, forcing them to go through something called transformation or re-education, which is essentially human re-engineering. Based on the United States government's estimate, uh, since late 2016, Chinese government has locked up anywhere between two to three million Uyghurs in a uh, industrial scale concentration camps that the world has not seen since the Holocaust era. But based on the Chinese government's white paper published in 2019, they put through 1.3 million Uyghurs through a re-education program since 2015. So if you, put, if you add that numbers up, it's, it gives you uh, an idea how uh, pervasive, how expensive this process has been. Even if it's as 1 million as the media have been reporting, that's more than the population of our nation's capital. So help the students understand what the link is between the Uyghur people and religious persecution. What sort of things is China doing to try to interfere with the religious practice of this Muslim group of people? And, and why does China care? Why does it matter to them to do that? That's a great question. Actually, it, it helps to understand um, this audience and those tuning in through live stream uh, to, to see why China has been engaging in this act of gen genocide. Uh, throughout the history, the Chinese Communist Party has been uh, very hostile to religion. Specifically, they have this term called foreign religion mm -hmm. that uh, includes uh, primarily, uh, it, 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 it refers to Abrahamic religion, but since not many Jews left in China, it is essentially the Muslims and the Christians. So the Chinese state, uh, these two religions in particular poses an existential threat. A threat uh, includes um, uh, ideological competition. As you know, uh, Abrahamic religion and communist ideology are not compatible. So because of that, the Chinese authorities, the Chinese policymakers, Chinese uh, government officials believe that uh, these two religions in particular uh, need to be transformed. Uh, so as a result, they have been rewriting the text uh, the Bible and Quran to be exact, uh, they have this program called the Sinicization Pro Project. So they're rewriting uh, the text uh, of uh, Quran and Bible. And also the other way that they see this is uh, also a source of uh, potential unrest, potential um, political upheaval because this Western religion in their understanding brings uh, freedom of thought, freedom of speech, freedom of press, and freedom of religion. So that it, that goes on the face of the communist ideology. And also, uh, importantly, the Chinese authorities uh, sees these two religions in particular uh, as something as, uh, displays signs of disloyalty. So it's a, dislo it's a disloyalty concern and also potential unrest or source for unrest. 
compel the Chinese leadership to wage war on faith, specifically on Islam and Christianity. And they're saying it's a disloyalty because China is saying, you as our citizens should have no higher allegiance than to our political party. And so when religious people are saying, no, my highest and most important allegiance is to my God, they view that as a threat to loyalty to them. Certainly, certainly. This is one of the methods that they're using to break the people who have been taken to the camp. Mm. They have this patriotic education. They make uh, the detainees to chant. Uh, slogans uh, saying that the party give me this prosperous, happy life. Therefore, anything I have in this life is indebted to the party. So that's, uh, you know, as I've been saying in public repeatedly, it's a, it's a human re-engineering. Yeah, there's a, there's a passage you write about that's really powerful on page 100. Um, if you'd be willing to read this to the students where you talk about some of the words they're forcing Uyghurs to say that violate their own faith. <coughs> I have uh, profiled a uh, camp survivor, Zumrat uh, Dawood, who's based in Washington. She is, she is one of the uh, luckiest uh, camp detainees, uh, survived the genocide and survived the, the concentration camp. Through her interview with me uh, during the process of this, uh, writing this book, she told me uh, horrific stories, including this. Zumrat recalled with shudder the first time she was forced to renounce her religion. The party of Pratchek leading the meeting shouted out the assembled Uyghurs, is there a God? The shocked crowd paused before answering, no. They had to. Other members of the neighborhood watch were scrutinizing their reactions as they stood around the flag, flag full. Zumrat moved her lips without saying the words that first time. Who is your God? The meeting leader called. Xi Jinping, the crowd dutifully chanted back. Later, when Zumrat got home, she prayed for forgiveness. It's powerful. What are some of the other things that the government does to force Uyghur people to contradict their faith? I know the uh, Washington Post published an article about how some Uyghurs are fo forced to sell alcohol in their shops, which they have religious objections to, just to you know, try and water down their faith. What are some of the other acts or words Uyghur people are forced to say to contradict what they believe? In April 2017, the local um, legislation, the rubber stamp legislative body, uh, enacted something called de-extremification measure that essentially criminalized 48 behaviors, growing beard, uh, wearing religious outfit, uh, praying, keeping prayer mat, religious text, uh, adhering to halal diet, refusing to smoke, uh, drink, uh, and also uh, interfering your children's uh, relationship with somebody who's from the outside of the ethnic group and religion. So as a result, a lot of Uyghurs had to force to adjust their lifestyle. Uyghurs are very conservative by nature. Mm -hmm. I grew up in one of those conservative societies uh, in Kashgar. Uh, so that in of itself can make you feel that you're doing things that are against your bill, a belief, uh, your, your, your God. Right. So that's something that happens outside of the camp. And to make the matters worse, um, as I wrote in, that, in this book, um, uh, Washington Post columnist Fred Hyatt likened what's happened to the Uyghurs as every day in Kristallnacht. Uh, <laughs> those of you familiar with the European history, uh, you know that, that there was an orchestrated attempts by Nazi Germany to destroy a Jewish uh, culture, mm -hmm. uh, places of worship. Exactly the same type of destructive efforts are happening. I wrote about this extensively, uh, erasure of Uyghur culture. So some of the um, places of worship uh, turned into a theme park for tourists to come in. And in some cases that uh, uh, cemeteries have been flattened, uh, destroyed, and turning into a hotel or business park or theme park. I think Hilton Hotel was one of the Western companies were building a hotel in a, uh, in a site uh, that used to be a cemetery. Mm. You spoke a minute ago about growing up in some of these communities. I'd like to just talk a little bit about your growing up experience. I mean, you were born in a Chinese re-education camp, and you have uh, this passage where you speak about some of the hardship your mother have to, had to go through 
giving birth to you in one of these camps, how she suffered terribly physically and emotionally. And this line, you say, I was badly malnourished because my mother was malnourished. When she tried to breastfeed me, almost no milk came out and she would cry in pain. Can you speak a little bit about how did that form you as a person, being born into this scenario and having your parents go through that? And talk a little bit more about early on when you were a child and in this camp, what your parents were going through. The family time, the normalcy in my life that I could have enjoyed um, uh, with my family, uh, with my uh, friends and colleagues in Washington have been taken away from me. Um, I graduated from law school in 2004. Uh, that's the last time uh, that I saw my mother when she came to Washington to attend my law school graduation. Uh, my father uh, passed away about five months ago while I was in a trip to Uzbekistan. Because of uh, my being sanctioned by the Communist China, I could not attend my father's funeral and hold my mother while we were mourning. Um, it's been a long time since I saw my mother, and this, in light of the background, you know, the bond that we have uh, through the difficult times that I spent with her and she endured, um, it, it, it is heartbreaking with, uh, beyond words to even describe how upset I am. You know, I'm supposed to, you know, I'm, I should be allowed to be upset in the circumstances like this. I think you're allowed. Yeah, and I, and I also came to grip with the reality because of my wonderful parents who never even raised their voice, knowing all the hardship that they had to endure, mm. including forcibly uh, give uh, DNA samples about seven years ago. This was the beginning of today's nightmare. Uh, and Chinese government's refusal to let my mother come, to the, come back to the United States to meet her uh, five uh, American grandchildren between me and my brothers. Um, and I still, I, you know, I like to keep it in a positive uh, thinking, or hope, but I don't think that I will see her again in this life. It's not because of her, she's unable to travel or she doesn't have a means to purchase ticket to come to the United States. It's because of China's willful hostage taking of an American citizen. China will not let you. That in of itself should give you an idea what we're dealing with. Uh, just let this think in that you have parents and you're not permitted to introduce your family, kids, loved ones to your parents because some government does not like what you do as a free person. That's essentially what is happening to me and my family. Yeah, and you're a government official. Yeah. So the fact that they can do this to a powerful and influential person in our country. Yes, and we, our government rightfully has been uh, talking about transnational repression, but we don't have a legal tools to go after those officials who are not physically here but uh, being offshore to torture, uh, uh, causing psychological torture, anguish to our fellow citizens in the United States. Mm -hmm. So this is something, and I'm speaking in a law school audience, this is something we need to look at. The existing laws, existing uh, legal tools that, that does not, don't really address uh, something this unique uh, and ongoing uh, that I myself have been dealing with. You and your mom have such a special bond. I can't imagine what that's like for you to not be able to see her and to not have been able to say goodbye to your father. Um, can you speak a little bit more, just starting at the beginning, about how your parents ended up in the re-education camp and talk about you know, the beatings and the other things your mother suffered as a pregnant woman when she was in this camp pregnant with you? It, it is, it's very similar to what is happening today. Uh, the re-education camp, the forced labor camp that my parents were locked up uh, were very similar to Stalin's gulag. Mm -hmm. But what we're seeing today uh, shares a lot of hallmarks, commonalities with the Nazi camps. Uh, the reason my mother was taken to the camp was simply because of uh, her relationship with her father, who happened to be one of the vocal critics of the Chinese state, also uh, involved and hold an important position in the uh, uh, the East Turkestan Republic uh, government, 
that dismantled uh, by Stalin, mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 and that was the, essentially the historically the beginning of today's Uyghur nightmare. And my father's side, um, he had two cousins living in the Soviet Union, uh, guilt by association, same thing with my mother, same thing with my father. And as a university graduate, um, a newly vetted couple, so my mom was dragged into the re-education camp while she was uh, pregnant in her uh, last trimester with me, mm -hmm. and dad was sent to a labor camp performing agricultural labor, which is essentially the same thing, the Uyghur people still being subject to re-educate. Re-education is a code word. It's a euphemism. Euphemism. It's a, it's a, it sounds very innocuous, you know, they call it thought, trans, uh, thought transformation, they call it re-education. It's nice and sanitized. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, they're even using it to people of Hong Kong, people of Taiwan recently. Uh, that gives me a chill in my bones because I know exactly, because I was born in re-education camp right. myself, I know exactly what they wanted to do with this uh, sound innocuous, uh, harmless term. Um, and, and my dad's uh, experience in labor camp also shares a lot of commonality with the people who have been subject to modern day slavery mm. today. That is uh, making the consumer products uh, what we're talking about is over uh, 80 global brands have been implicated. And as we consumers, we can talk about later uh, yeah. when we get to that point, but uh, it, it, you know, people often say history repeats itself, but we allow history to repeat. Uh, initially, you asked me how this affected, you know, I never planned to talk about this horrific uh, uh, upbringing or background. Even my close associates uh, in Washington did not even know that I had such a, um, a terrifying, yeah. uh, uh, bittersweet memories in China. But in 2018, after hearing some same thing coming back, the concentration camps were being rebuilt, yeah. and the people dragged in based on their ethnic background, religious belief, past writing, uh, teaching, yeah. uh, even some stage performers, athletes. And I thought, this is, this is so crazy. Um, I need to share this story. Mm -hmm. So my uh, uh, dissatisfaction initially with the Chinese government started as I grew up. I was walking by that building, the Soviet built, uh, Soviet style giant building. Well, your mom was in prison. Yeah, and I was, and I, I grew up past walking by with her, uh, looking at that building and hearing all the uh, uh, psychological, physical torture she endured. She gave me birth while she was injured. Yeah, her hip yeah. was broken, right? Yes. And so, because she had been beat, she had fallen downstairs. Yeah. She was almost starved to death. And even to this day, she suffers uh, the chronic uh, pain that she had been dealing with in the last 50 some years. So yes, history is repeating because we're allowing it to repeat. Yeah. So why, you spoke to this a little bit, but maybe a little more directly explain, why did you decide to write the book No Escape and why this title? Um, as I alluded, um, I was not planning to talk about, you know, I would love to have a, a life as one job. Doing the nice things, and private. Yeah, not doing the things that what most people do, especially in our uh, line of work. Um, but it, it, I didn't have that luxury. So, and also, um, um, and I was very frustrated, as I noted in my uh, in, in in parts of my book, when we were telling the stories about people disappearing, uh, even some level-headed, reasonable government officials. Some sympathetic people, even NGO community, find it in disbelief. So I thought, okay, I owe it to my people, I owe it to myself, um, owe it to the world to tell Uyghur story because I know storytelling can be very powerful, mm. and I didn't want people to think, oh, this is something just new pop up in this country that a lot of people had this fanciful thinking mm -hmm. that uh, helping the state talk about China with technology, with education, with, with, with economic progress and trade, this, this country will be becoming one of us. So I want to tell them that this, this has been a, a, a naivete from the beginning in the last 20, 30 years. And what is happening in China is not something new. This has been ongoing under the different name. So that's one. And then I, uh, you know, through my uh, professional life and, and the role in the government, I had to meet and talk to uh, uh, camp survivors, direct, mm -hmm. indirect victims, that includes our fellow American citizens. Right. And I decided, you know, I need to tell this story. 
I just profile some of them, not all of them. Uh, and that's one thing. And the other thing is that I want people in, um, in, in our society, as I felt that I have not been able to escape uh, as the other Uyghurs from this persecution, I wanted the American people to feel that they cannot escape this reality. Because this, this issue is so well connected uh, for wrong reason with American values, American ideals, uh, religious freedom, freedom of speech, and all the freedom that we appreciate, and also our economic interest, um, our uh, competition in the world stage uh, on technology, science and technology, and also global leadership. So what kind of country do you want? So if you don't, if you still feel that you are feel indifferent about this, then you're mistaken because this is so, so you cannot escape. So the, the title, the background. Multiple um, levels. Yeah, there. yes. Yeah, we cannot escape this, you can't escape this, and as Americans, we can't keep looking away anymore right. from right. what's going on. Right. What was the most surprising thing that you learned when you were working on this book? A um, few things really uh, jumped out at me when I was reading about the Holocaust. Uh, studying the Second World War. One, um, the targeted attack on the intellectuals, mm. thought leaders. Professors. Professors and, and religious leaders, mm. business leaders. And then that's one thing that, was, that I found it to be horrifyingly similar to what the Nazi regime did. did. And the other uh, surprise is uh, targeted attack on women and children. That's what China is doing right now. Yes. Um, uh, through forced labor, mm -hmm. uh, you know, as you may know that Dhaka was built by Jewish women. Similarly, uh, Uyghur women have been uh, enslaved in the global supply chain, and their hair, hair product, the, the, their heads are shaved and using that hair to make uh, wigs and being sold in the African American community in the United States. There is a future story uh, on CNN about specifically how uh, women's body part the hair oh. being commercialized. And also uh, forced separation of families um, based on New York Times article. Uh, this was after I, would, I already had the manuscript. Uh, 800,000 Uyghur children have been separated from their family members. This is also a commonality. And also the, the camp system is also very, very similar. So uh, the individuals taken to the camp based on their uh, ethnicity and religion, and uh, uh, outreach of court. There's no judicial process, no access to lawyers, no access to courts. And you and mentioned they have often like cartoonish allegations for what right, being right. detained. Like you're leaving, you know, you go to, you, you've gone to this country that includes the United States. You Germany. haven't purchased enough alcohol lately. Yeah. And, and then uh, through some online um, uh, retail stores, uh, the government traced down their uh, purchase history, mm -hmm. uh, buying prayer mat, uh, uh, and also they could track down download of religious text through this app uh, promoted by Silicon Valley called Zapia. Mm -hmm. So that kind of uh, uh, things that you've done without knowing, uh, without thinking or expecting government will find a problem uh, resulted in, in detention. And also the other, um, uh, even though that's not a, exactly the type of technology that the, 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 uh, the Hitler's regime used, there's some use of technology, for example, the biomedical research. Right. Whereas on the Uyghur case, there was a DNA collection uh, starting from 2015. Which happened to your parents. Yeah, it happened to my parents. And one of the American uh, medical scientists, a very well-known professor at Yale Medical School, Professor Kenneth Kidd, brought in a Chinese uh, Minister of Public Security official to his lab to conduct DNA research, believed to be a Uyghur DNA. Um, and then the other uh, aspect is also very similar, that uh, uh, in a similar way that Hitler did bringing in International Red Cross, Chinese have been bringing in uh, friendly government, uh, representatives, mm -hmm. diplomats, media people to show Potemkin villages. So there's a lot of uh, disturbing um, <coughs> Uh, commonalities that I, 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 I found out mm -hmm. during the process of researching and writing this book. You talked a little bit about uh, women and children and how they're being affected. So let's, let's take each of those one by one. You describe in your book China's actions as a war on Uyghur women. Can you speak a little bit more to some of the particular horrors 
that many Uyghur women are subjected to? And maybe some of the specific stories that you highlight in your book of these women. As I grew up uh, in China, I witnessed a Uyghur woman being treated as a sex subject because of their looks, Eurasian look, physique. Um, and also the Chinese men uh, often uh, makes lots of uh, offensive comments about Uyghur women. Uh, I've heard that when I was even going to college. But now, fast forward, uh, the Uyghur women are going through essentially three types of uh, tortures. Uh, the one, uh, uh, mass detention, internment. And those Uyghur women who are taken into the camps are conservative Uyghur women who either disobey the government's instruction mm -hmm. not to pray, uh, wearing a headscarf, or having more than two children. Mm -hmm. So the birth control is one of the most um, uh, harrowing uh, method that the Chinese have government has used on Uyghur women. You know, Uyghur a woman, uh, like our conservative uh, uh, fellow citizen here, the, uh, when you conceive, when you're pregnant, that's God's gift, no one has anything, can interfere to, you know, go, force you to go one way or the other. That's the pretty much Many traditional, beliefs. Yeah, yeah. traditional belief. Uh, and also, um, um, after they are detained in the camps, uh, based on my interview with the camp survivors, they were given a mysterious pills. Uh, a, to control their emotion. So when they saw the pictures of their families. So you don't cry for your husband, you cry, don't cry for your kids. And the other is, is so, so disturbing. Even after they're sexually assaulted, they don't show reaction. And then the other and they thing. they have this pill. Yes, and then this pill that controls their uh, period. Uh, and last December, United States government um, sanctioned or the uh, entity listed uh, Chinese Military Medical Academy for developing uh, brain control weaponry. Mm -hmm. So that weaponry was is already uh, developed. It's a product. The, what the U.S. government did was to prevent our technology firms to provide software and tech, uh, hardware support. Mm -hmm. So I suspect that some of those weapons have been used against the Uyghur woman. And other uh, sexual violence, uh, as Tursnai Ziaudun uh, told BBC that I included in the book, there's a gang rape, uh, there's a, a, um, a um, You're saying frequent gang rape yeah, of these and, women. In and then after that, as if that's not enough, they torture uh, using tools to um, uh, cause physical pain uh, to those. Often it sterilizes these women yes. for life. Right? And then uh, in both inside and outside the camp, they've been using the methods of forced sterilization. I profiled a former camp instructor in my book, uh, Khal Nur Siddiq, who was forced to go through sterilization, <coughs> even though she had no plan to conceive, even though she's already a middle-aged woman. Mm -hmm. Uh, as a result, in just two years, uh, the natural growth of the Uyghur population had dropped by 65%. And that's one of the main reasons that uh, the United States government, Republican and Democratic uh, administration, uh, officially recognized what is happening to the Uyghur people as a genocide and crimes against humanity. Many of you know the legal definition, but at least two of them. Uh, uh, purposeful, deliberate prevention of natural growth of the population in the case of forced sterilization, and also forcible removal of children to another group, mm -hmm. that is also. So by locking up 800,000 Uyghur children, they're also committing genocide against children. Now let's talk a little bit more about children. You describe in your book experiences you have had working with some of these Uyghur clients, parents who get out but their children were separated from them and are left behind. And they, these parents want to have a video call with their children to reconnect. Talk about what that was like for you, what you saw, what it was like for the parents. So I, um, it, you know, as a parent of a new, uh, two small kids myself, um, this, this- Five hits, and two, yeah, right? Yeah, five and two. Uh, this hits me the most. Yeah. I can't imagine those mothers uh, who recognize their children's face in a, a TikTok message. Not only once, multiple examples. In, a, in a, uh, one of those um, uh, instances, uh, a Turkey-based father 
was seeing his son on the lap of a Chinese police uh, shouting uh, pro-CCP slogan, knowing that that person and the person that he, that little child is phrasing, as a result, was the reason for him to be separated from his family members. Um, and also, uh, the a few uh, uh, female uh, Uyghurs, female individuals based in Turkey, one of them testified in the Uyghur tribunal, uh, concluded last year that she also have at least two kids um, in the uh, Chinese uh, detention facility for the uh, children. So they, in addition to um, keeping them in those uh, uh, children's camps, they call it uh, boarding school, they're also sending uh, young... It's just like Harry Potter, basically. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes. It, and then they're sending uh, young Uyghur kids to inland high schools mm. to for... I mean, it's a kind of a softer version of the uh, forced assimilation right. to speak and eat and possibly marry uh, the Han Chinese individuals. And one, I forgot that the other aspect of uh, the uh, Chinese war on Uyghur women, forced marriage. Yeah. Um, this Let's talk a little bit about what the relatives do to the women. Too. Yeah, this is not really an um, easy topic in the United States because we are a diverse uh, uh, society. Uh, you know, we don't really talk about a biracial marriage is, is problematic here. But in China, because it's a government uh, orchestrated effort to forcing Uyghur women to marry Han Chinese men, and Uyghur, For the goal of assimilation. Assimilation, also Uyghur woman has no right to say no. Because if she said no, as I alluded earlier, she would be like, uh, uh, she will get the title, of, she would be labeled as an extremist. Mm -hmm. Either herself or her family would be punished. As for the uh, relative uh, program, uh, American scholar Darren Byler uh, published a long story, a future story about three years ago and uh, he estimated about a one million Chinese cadres, essentially the Chinese spies, uh, sent to Uyghur homes, uh, specifically those who have no uh, male household leader or husbands taken to the camp, sleeping, eating with those um, uh, female uh, uh, mothers and uh, uh, individuals in their homes, uninvited, sleeping in their bed, eating with them on their diet, their dining table. And worse yet, they force their children to spy on the parents. And after they visit, they have a separate conversation with the kids asking like, do your parents pray at home? Do your parents tell us, uh, tell you to say things or do things a certain way to pass this uh, test? Uh, and an honest answer by children could uh, result in parents going to those incarceration. Camps. And also sexual violence by those uh, uh, Chinese uh, apprachic uh, individuals in, in private homes, also something despicable happening. As I profiled in my book, um, I had her permission to use that uh, story. There was a, uh, um, a scene that a Chinese uh, uh, individual uh, sent by the government uh, walks around in a boxer uh, in the kitchen, sexually molests this Uyghur woman while her husband is sitting in the living room. So they even force a man, uh, that's, not, that's not acceptable in any society, to, to tell his wife that, you know, just suck it up, this is gonna pass uh, just one week. And this is happening in somebody's private home. Uh, in addition to all the other uh, horrifying stories that I, I shared with you. Um, you were again talking about parents earlier. Can you describe some of those instances you've had where a parent is finally able to reconnect with the child on video chat and then the child has like no reaction? To no it. reaction and, and uh, it's just to go about as, 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 as usual. So that's a total stranger. A total stranger totally. treating the parent as a stranger while uh, appeared to be enjoying his time with that po police in a uh, plain clothes, yeah. uh, brainwashing that child and making, forcing him to disassociate from his uh, biological parents. What are some of the ways that China is perfecting its approach? You talked about digital dictatorship. I mean, you've yeah. described how China has downloaded the purchase history a yeah. lot of a lot of these weaker, weaker people. Yeah. How is China perfecting and using new digital tools of oppression that we've never seen before? 
The uh, China uh, has, uh, this is one of the reasons that I believe that the American people should no longer feel indifferent about what's happening. Uh, the, the Chinese government have initially tested or developed and tested um, surveillance um, techniques and equipment uh, through a social credit system. And it, since 2016, uh, it has been implemented both in Tibet and the Uyghur homeland. So what these uh, surveillance apparatus uh, techniques uh, centers do is to uh, monitor every aspect of Uyghur lives, including uh, putting up a, a QR code on your door, uh, essentially provides uh, who lives at their house, what kind of history that person or the family have, and also forcing you to uh, surrender your phone in a mobile uh, cyber uh, command centers on the streets to let your phone to be scanned. If, you, if they find anything objectionable, uh, foreign contact, um, uh, traces of visiting questionable websites, or using VPN, then you are, you are, you're become a candidate for, for the camps. So now it's been so effectively tested. Um, as of 2020, uh, 80, more than 80 countries around the world have either adopted or imported uh, Chinese surveillance techniques. So the United States government uh, included this as, an, as part of the competition aspect of our foreign policy approach with uh, communist China. But this is creating a new norm. Uh, Google CEO Eric Schmitz uh, uh, predict that in the next few years, we will have two internet systems. One is the current one led by the United States, the other one will be the Chinese version of the internet. You can imagine how messy the world will become with that kind of two internet system, the banking, the air traffic, uh, electric grids. We will have a major problem. On top of that, with this surveillance uh, that they uh, effectively utilized, uh, including to monitor uh, every movement, uh, even uh, private conversation, if there's any within the camp. But now they're exporting and uh, providing this technology to authoritarian regimes, despots around the world. So what does it mean is that you, we will have a kind of a new normalcy that the, uh, the governments around the world will monitor uh, voting records, bare minimum, uh, mm -hmm. And, and the privacy is off the topic. Even me being in the United States, sometimes I have to put my phone away because I don't have the kind of a, a confidence, peace of mind that I have the privacy. It's here. And let me also share with you something that may be, uh, uh, may be uh, in, of an interest to you. The United States, um, uh, in the United States, in our universities, colleges, uh, uh, high schools, any schools, hospitals and prison system, we use uh, the Chinese camera, Hikvision. That company has been added to the entity list and have been also publicly noted that uh, it causes security concern. Uh, in the city of London, uh, reportedly at least one million cameras produced, <coughs> made by this company, have been uh, utilized. Uh, and also there's another company called ZTE. Uh, it's also one of the major Chinese tech firms, also connected to the Chinese state. Uh, developed uh, a street light with uh, motion detecting cameras, which is a music to the ears of some um, governments. They are fearful of their own population. So even the street lights now, with the support of the ZTE, has cameras, mo motion detection cameras. And also, the, um, I, uh, I cited an author in my book, uh, a German uh, journalist who spent a lot of time in China. He has a book called We Have Been Harmonized. In his book, he walks into this uh, Chinese tech firm, uh, iFly Tech. Uh, as soon as he enters the lobby, it's, uh, he reads the slogan, we rule China today, but we will rule uh, the world tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So this is part of China's global ambition. Uh, you know, those of us who live in here uh, saw, uh, felt that uh, we have benefited from the technological advancement, but the progress um, in science and technology in China is, has not been a moral progress. This is part of their uh, global ambition mm -hmm. and part of their method to control the population. If that method, as you have seen in the case of this current lockdown, 
uh, it's still ongoing. Uh, we're sitting here without masks for the most part. In China, the lockdown is, is becoming a part of life. Uh, and they're using that technology to monitor surveillance. So I'm afraid that this, if we not push back, if we don't take this seriously, our privacy, our freedom, our, our way of life will be threatened by this new norm that the China is creating. You were discussing ways in which, because of this new norm, other countries are starting to do similar things. Can you talk a little bit about, in your book, the practices you describe that countries like India and Nigeria are now engaging in sort of to compete and keep up with what China is doing? Um, you know, in, in my book, I have a chapter called The Reinvention of Genocide. Um, because of the international community's uh, inability to stop this genocide, for the most part, um, willful ignorance, feigning ignorance. Uh, the atrocities against vulnerable religious ethnic communities is becoming kind of a, a fact of life today. Um, in Nigeria, for example, uh, the Christian community has been subject to atrocity crimes because, largely because of government inaction. And also in India, as we have been uh, publicly discussing as part of my personal and private uh, uh, professional life, uh, there has been a targeted attack against the Indian Muslims in Assam uh, area. So this needs to be condemned. You know, uh, in, in the last 50 years, the international community have seen, repeatedly have seen uh, genocide crimes against humanity committed against vulnerable ethno-religious group. And we have not done much. Um, I recently participated in a, a documentary <coughs> called Broken Promise. So essentially we went through uh, a cases were uh, never again, uh, never again, uh, the promise never again, been repeatedly broken. Mm. So uh, if you continue with this trend line, the international law will become a dead letter. Uh, if this trend line continues, if you continue to look the other way, then the others will be emboldened, encouraged that they can get away with this kind of crime in a bright, broad daylight. So. Uh, I always say this, um, the Uyghurs have paid ultimate price. People of Hong Kong paid ultimate price. Uh, people of Ukraine paid ultimate price to wake up the world to this brutal regime, one in Moscow, one in Beijing. But it's on, on us to act and stop it. What has the invasion of Ukraine, what impact has that had on the situation in China? It's, it's related, uh, Stephanie. Um, uh, there have been positive and negative things uh, can be described uh, out of what's happening in, in Ukraine. Uh, on a positive perspective, I think the, the unity that the international community has shown quickly in response to Putin's invasion of Ukraine made the leadership in Beijing to believe that the democracy, democratic West is not dead yet. Uh, it, it is a very powerful message. And also, uh, in less than two weeks, the global businesses either suspended or pulled out of uh, Russia uh, since the invasion. That also given Beijing a kind of a wake up call that the United States led West, Western uh, democracies can rally support. At the same time, it may have speed up their process of decoupling in a technology and, and in, the, in the supply chain. And then uh, the negative aspect, I worry that uh, the Putin's invasion of Ukraine and uh, uh, the, the military support, societal support, financial support that the Ukrainian people are getting may have moved up their plan to invade Taiwan. Mm -hmm. uh, that really worries me because when you, if that happens, what we're seeing in Ukraine uh, will be a minuscule because it will be calamities is, is unspeakable. Uh, in, in the event that China invades Taiwan. It's, uh, it, the, the Chinese leadership has been talking about this for a long time, and they also made a pledge that this, this, this will not be left to the next generation. To me, it's just a matter of time. So what do you think is the trajectory of China-U.S. relations? I think, that, you know, uh, we've been talking about uh, horrifying uh, things that happened to the Uyghur people. Mm -hmm. But to me now, two things, uh, is happening or about to happen. One, the U.S. foreign policy establishment can no longer in ignore uh, the human rights uh, uh, abuses uh, being committed against the Uyghurs, Tibetans, and now the people of Hong Kong. 
And, and because of this regime really showed its true color, uh, and American people, I don't think, will allow our politicians to treat this fundamental issue that goes to the heart of our values as something that are ignorable. And also, because of the connection, the Uyghur atrocities, uh, uh, the Chinese uh, uh, atrocity against the Uyghurs, so uh, uh, intertwined with uh, the competition aspect in the technology, uh, alignment aspect in our relationship with uh, like-minded governments and liberal democracies, and also um, uh, our co commercial interest, trade and investment in the context of supply chain. Mm. I think this issue may be uh, treated differently. And also, I am also worrying at the same time that uh, some people in our government who still believes that China is, some, is a regime or government that can have a relationship with, will try to slow the process or tone it down, as has been the case of the environmental activists. Mm -hmm. uh, as we speak, there's an there's a, a existing uh, pressure on the Biden administration by uh, some academic institutions, by some think tanks, uh, and also the environmental activists that going hard on China, on human rights, will negatively affect uh, China's cooperation in climate change. Mm. It doesn't work like that, when, uh, but people are still trying to do it. So that keeps me uh, worried a little bit. Mm. Uh, but, but I am somewhat optimistic, um, cautiously optimistic, because of the decisions made in Congress through legislative mandate and also the executive decisions. We talked about two pieces of legislation that have become law in, in three years. More than 100 punitive sanctions been imposed on Chinese entities and individuals in the last three, four years by both Trump administration and Biden administration. That gives me hope that we are heading into a new type of relationship with communist China. You say that using passive voice that, the, you know, this legislation just happened to become law, but Nuri's being very modest. I think he's one of the key reasons <laughs> that legislation became law, the Forced Uyghur Prevention Act, right? That yeah. is holding more companies accountable for what they're doing. So really quick, let's give you a round of applause for that. <laughs> and, and what you're doing, Nuri, I mean, it's a volunteer position, and you're not a paid lobbyist. There's not a lot of other unions you're bringing. You, you were just going office by office to members of Congress saying, we can't let this continue. I think that's incredible. It's also a beauty of our country, and you know, we can lobby our government. Uh, the the accomplished legislative accomplishments that uh, Stephanie is, is, is mentioning have happened uh, with zero monetary investment. Right, I mean, and it has been amazing. receiving bipartisan support in both bills. We have uh, received uh, unanimous consent in the Senate, and more than hundred members of the House side voting in favor. There's a joke in Washington that if you wanted to bring uh, the members of Congress together, talk about China, talk about the leaders, <laughs> <laughs> or get Nuri Turkel in the room. One of those things. Uh, we've you brought up a few times technology, and you mentioned earlier how the incredible technological progress we've seen and benefited from in our country and across the world has not come without a heavy moral price. Can you talk a little bit more about how, you know, it's easy for us to sit in the audience and think, that's terrible what's happening. The Kevin's were over here in Indiana where we're not persecuting Uyghurs, but how are we maybe even unwittingly complicit in what is going on, even just in the way that we spend our dollars? Tech, with cotton or technology, any of those things. Two ways that the uh, businesses uh, made us complicit in the ongoing crimes in China, uh, starting from Hollywood uh, self-censorship. You know, in a situation like this, uh, you would be seeing movies and after movies and Hollywood stars making speeches after speeches when they were receiving Oscar. To this day, zero. That shows uh, how horrible uh, uh, our movie industry has been uh, controlled. And then the other piece is the, uh, the investment in Chinese technology, Chinese businesses is still ongoing. Uh, some venture capitalist uh, uh, hedge funds still raising millions of dollars in a broad daylight. And they're not only that, they go on CNBC 
uh, or a, a global uh, TV network to brag about how successful that they have been. Uh, and then uh, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce led uh, business community, specifically in the apparel industry, have been pressuring our Congress, pressuring um, our uh, executive branch not to do anything. Uh, that's also one, one and then also the, the same companies have uh, been um, uh, ignoring something so obvious uh, in the case of the uh, Genocide Olympic uh, in February. Mm. Uh, the companies like Nike, Coca-Cola, Visa, Omega, uh, Airbnb uh, officially sponsored the Genocide Olympics in the backdrop of all this public discussion and media reporting. And also, um, uh, because American people have been so used to buy or addicted, if I may, in the last 20, 30 years to buy cheap products coming from China, we're also fueling this genocide. Because you know, if you go to Amazon today, if you go to Walmart, Target, you still find stuff made in China. Uh, yeah, some, it's cheap for a reason. People it, made it for it, free. Yeah, it's, slaves. it's slave labor. Yeah. And also one other sector need to be mentioned, which is the uh, uh, green technology, solar panels and batteries to be exact. Uh, the solar panel industry uh, uh, has been heavily uh, uh, involved uh, or utilizing uh, in China the, uh, the Uyghur forced labor, the specifically Polo Silicon uh, uh, making process. And some people in our country not being very honest, uh, saying things like we cannot compete with China, it takes 10 years to catch up. It's not accurate statement. As a country, as a society, we don't enslave people. And also when we make solar panels, we don't use dirty coal. That is exactly what is happening. And there, we have layers of problems. So this is, you know, often as I said, this is on us. You know, we can talk about how China behaving badly uh, all day long, rightfully so. And we have a reason, every reason to talk about. But how about us? What are we doing? Mm. What are we doing? And we, we have the ability, we have means to stop this. What are we doing? You know, I live in the intersection of business, law, and government. I, I know what investors think of a company if they have a, if they've been in bad uh, light. Uh, if there's a headline news saying company XYZ using slave labor and the consumers are boycotting this product, the investors will pay attention to it. Mm. And they will put pressure on the businesses. That has not happened yet. Uh, so my call to you is this, very simple. So if you see a product, consumer products, whether it be in Costco, uh, an Amazon. Or, Tell them the cotton blend, by the way. Yeah, is. the cotton, uh, specifically the cotton products. The chance of you buying a product, consumer product, baby pajamas, undershirt, uh, sports outfit, made by a fellow human being uh, who are enslaved is quite high. So you'd save to put it back if you see made in China. Now that the businesses have been very uh, smart, quote unquote, changing the label, uh, label to PRC. Most American uh, public consumers don't know what PRC is. And also they have been uh, relocating, report this has to be verified, to neighboring countries and transporting the uh, Uyghur slaves to neighboring countries to make those apparel. So um, uh, when you, uh, it, it, first thing first, if you see something made in China, specifically cotton products, uh, the 80% of the China made uh, cotton products are sourced in Xinjiang. 20% of the cotton products exported from China are sourced in Xinjiang. So the, the chances of you buying a uh, product, uh, wrapping your baby with a baby pajamas made by a fellow human being or enslaved is, is quite, uh, quite likely, so um, I call, I ask you to put it back. That would be one of the easiest way to uh, help to end the suffering of the Uyghur people who have been enslaved in modern day, uh, in the global supply chain. Yeah, you say on page 22, um, Xinjiang produces about 20% of the world's cotton supply, and then a little further below, for the first time since the heyday of antebellum south, cotton slavery is once again polluting the global economy on a huge industrial scale. Uh, we had a student submit a question in advance. It's relevant to what you're talking about with your call for action, but they said, what can we as students halfway around the world do to support the Uyghurs in a meaningful way? Are there actions we can take that can have a real impact? So other than just what you're talking about of being mindful as consumers of 
what we purchase. What else can students here at Notre Dame do? Public, inf uh, public education is so important. You know, world changes, but human nature won't. This is why I always bring up that never again promise every single time. It sounds very, very simple, but what are we doing to keep that promise? So we need to tell uh, our friends and colleagues, family members, there's an ongoing act of genocide uh, happening in a broad daylight in a, in a country that the international community has intimate economic diplomatic relationship with. We also need to um, uh, put pressure on our elective uh, government officials. I, you know, simple question is, what is your plan? Why this has been, it's been six years. What are you doing? And also, I would love uh, somebody organize um, a, a phone bank and just call the White House and ask them if they have a strategy. Mm -hmm. What is your strategy? What are you doing? Calling it genocide is just a policy response. What are you doing to stop it? And if you have any plan to hold those bad actors, perpetrators to account? Genocide Convention Article 1 specifically state, you know, you call it up when you see it, you stop it, and then hold on to account. Uh, our government and nine other governments, parliaments, calling this genocide just a step number one. Yeah. So what have we done? Uh, students, I'm going to give you a chance to ask questions in just a moment, and after that, Commissioner Turkel is going to be doing a book signing where you all are welcome to pick up a complimentary book of his. Let me just have you, before we get to questions, though, Nuri, close with a really powerful uh, passage that you write about in your epilogue, starting on page 332 um, and then picking up again on page 335. If you could just read this to students, I think it's really powerful. Thank you. And you can skip around if you want to shorten any of it. Thank you. I was worried about the Biden administration dropping the terms genocide and crimes against humanity in official statements. I aired my frustration with administration officials in the summer of 2021 when this trends, trend was glaringly apparent right about the time that the United States was withdrawing from Afghanistan. I was pleased that the White House resumed using these terms when it announced the diplomatic boycott of the Olympics in December 2021. Words matter and are incredibly consequential in a situation like the Uyghur crisis where phrases such as human rights violations or abuses and mistreatment are bandied about by governments and media but don't carry the same weight as genocide. <clears throat> Human beings can be abused without genocide having occurred and accountability for the very real horrors of genocide. Genocidal crimes must start with the proper language. I was also concerned that the business lobby and climate activists would kill the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act, which would, left Beijing, which would let Beijing to continue its enslavement of Uyghurs and continue to pollute the global supply chain with the goods produced by slave labor. Diplomatic boycott, which I had been uh, pu uh, pushing since May 2019, was a big victory but one that was more symbolic than practical. A much more a palpable move against China was when President Biden signed the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act into, two, into law two days before the Christmas in 2021. That put around 100 Chinese companies on the entity list for, the, for their links to the oppression of the Uyghurs. Crucially, it has also provided framework, framework for other countries, including European power, to base their own sanctions on, since this reality is a global supply chain problem and demands a worldwide response. In retaliation, China sanctioned me and three other members of the US Commission on International Religious Freedom, cutting me off from my family and trying to hurt me financially. But at night, I go home, and spend long, sleepless nights fretting about my family, about all the people I know who are in the concentration camps or whose relatives have disappeared. I am haunted by the memory of that little Uyghur child sitting on the knees of a Chinese police officer, playing with a cop as her, her heartbroken, ignored parents look on from thousands of miles away through a tiny screen on their phones. When I imagine, when I manage to talk with my old, frail parents, 
missing their children and scarcely even knowing their grandchildren, the pain is almost too much to bear. My father looks so weak these days, but I cannot reach out and hold him. I can't even tell him how sad I felt because that would be a victory for the Chinese police listening in. It would show them just how much they are hurting us, and that would give them the power to do even more. So I stayed strong as long as I can, then cry alone afterwards. I had fear that speaking up might condemn my parents to the camps. But in fact, speaking up may have spared them. Those who don't give voice to their cause remain silenced. And as 18th century English statesman Edmund Burke once observed, the only thing necessary for the trumpet of evil is for good men to do nothing. That is why I will always speak up, even if it is through my own tears. Thank you. Students, we have two handheld mics. If you want to ask a question, please raise your hand and we'll get the mic to you. Thank you, Denise. Thank you, Mr. Togo. What do you think is the most effective way the international community can do to stop this without letting the Uyghur? Uyghur people to pay the ultimate price. The reason I ask this is that the fact that the Western country enacted several laws sanctioning products from Xinjiang or made by Uyghurs, and because lots of Uyghurs people were fired by their employees, and they are paying the ultimate prices. That's clearly not the result that you are looking for. Stopping buying the product from Xinjiang won't stop the government to do some things either. Just make the Xinjiang people decrease their chance to get hired and to make a living in Xinjiang. So what do you think the most effective way the international community can do to stop this without letting the people paying the ultimate prices? Thank you. The, um, the point that you're making that uh, the Uyghur people, uh, either in Xinjiang or in other parts of China, making ultimate price. I don't know what price that we're talking about. They have been subject to enslavement. And this, this employment, quote unquote, uh, in those global supply chain or global brands is involuntary. Uh, unlike here, people don't apply for jobs on those assembly lines. They were forced to, to perform slave labor. So the, the, the benefit, beneficiaries of those um, uh, enslaved people, actually the quote, global uh, businesses, not the actual people. So I, I I don't agree with the notion that uh, people being hurt. Whether we pose those sanctions, whether we pass those legislative mandates uh, or not, uh, the Uyghur people's life will not, uh, will not be directly affected. What we, what we will have, uh, what we would like to see today is the, the businesses either leave the country because they have, they're facing reputational, legal, and investment risk today. Or the Chinese government stop this modern day slavery. It's one up to two must happen. And then the third thing that must happen is also the, uh, the European countries that also import uh, Xinjiang produced products need to put in place similar type of legislative mandate. So it has been the United States alone, and this problem has not been tackled by one country taking a leadership role. Um, I will stop after this. I, we have uh, CBP, uh, the Customs Border uh, 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 Protection, used to have about eight people in investigating uh, potentially tainted consumer products. But now with the help of Congress, we will have about 300. Wow. So we're doing uh, things that we can do in Washington, but again, this is not, cannot be a one-man show. We would like to see Canada, Australia, Japan, and European Union doing the same thing so that we can stop this modern day slavery. Question over here. Thank you, Bridget. 
Hi, hello. Thank you so much for coming and talking to us, Commissioner Turkel. Can I ask you, what was your reaction to the report by the UN's High Commissioner of Human Rights not deeming the atrocities in Xinjiang as genocide? Did that frustrate you? Were you just not surprised at all? And do you think that had any kind of impact in how seriously or not the international community has responded to the events or how seriously they take them? Thank you for that great question. I was, I, I was uh, worried that I will skip that. <laughs> we didn't have a chance to address. Um, in August, uh, literally 13 minutes prior to Michelle Bachelet's, uh, uh, the expression of uh, former high commissioner's job at the UN, uh, her agency released that report. Um, my immediate reaction was, okay, this is better than nothing. Uh, it is long overdue, uh, had it been released two years ago, three, because we knew that this report was, uh, was already been done. It could have saved some lives. Uh, we could have avoided some unnecessary academic discussion. Even, even to this day, people still debating whether this is genocide or not. Uh, the report uh, said that maybe uh, that, that, that is problematic. Uh, but the UN High Commissioner's Office did not have a mandate to produce report like this. So this was a discretionary um, matter for the High Commissioner. For that, she deserves some credit. And also, she was under enormous pressure uh, by China and its supporters. But she went ahead to release it, even if it was uh, just 13 minutes before she's leaving the door. But what is important is now, because this report has a UN stamp, uh, this will compel or force the member states to do something. Last Thursday, uh, the UN uh, uh, Human Rights Council uh, voted uh, just to the debate uh, on this report. Mm -hmm. uh, 17 to 19, uh, 19 uh, we lost. So this also exposes this through this report and this failed attempt to have a debate at the UN also shows how much the Chinese uh, government hijacked or controls the UN operations. Those of you familiar with the mandate, um, the UN uh, Declaration of Human Rights is, is modeled up the Bill of Rights. Uh, religious freedom in this country, the oldest human rights, it's, it's in our Declaration of Independence. It's even older document than the UN Declaration of Independence, not the UN Declaration of Human Rights. So the UN, uh, by ignoring their own mandate, not doing enough, not even publicly stating that this is something that, that it, it's required the UN to take action, uh, it's violating its own mandate. So the, 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 even Michelle Bachelet left the agency, uh, we still have the UN and member states. They need to do something about this. They, uh, they have not even organized a uh, emergency session yet with a 16 vote, they can do that. And also when you look at the countries that, had, that either voted against or abstain, kind of tells how effective China has been. Mm. Uh, you know, they do have bio-silence uh, through economic coercion. They also pressure countries, even Ukraine, abstain from voting. India. And the majority of Muslim countries, Qatar, Pakistan, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, voted down this, uh, just very small step to be able to debate. Just to debate it. Yeah, just to debate it. So um, in some way, it's a good report, um, as, as, noted, as noted earlier, but it didn't go far enough, and it came late. But we passed that period. When now is, what do we do about this? This is on the member states to take an action. We're running short on time. Let me just ask you one other question that was submitted by a student, speaking of voices being silent. They yeah. said, Nike has said it is of China and for China. The National Basketball Association and its players seem willing to speak on virtually every issue except for Chinese genocide. Uh, I'll add that you know, many law firms are quiet about Chinese genocide. Very few law schools are speaking up about Chinese genocide. Why are so many important players silent on this issue? I, 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 did, I forgot to mention uh, the uh, sports world. Um, the NBA has been a culprit, and biggest problem, the biggest problem. Um, two things are happening. Um, the Chinese using a coercive, corrosive, corrupt method to engage in influence operations. 
uh, with the case of NBA, because they have such a big market, the sponsors, uh, specifically Nike, uh, have been in the pocket, has been in the pocket of the Chinese state. So they're preventing the NBA, even athletes, to speak up. Uh, Ennis Cantor, a former uh, basketball NBA player, is out of job now because he spoke out against the Chinese state. He protested the way that the Uyghurs were treated, the Hong Kong people were treated, the Taiwanese people were treated. Now he is a free agent, he has no job essentially. Former Houston Rocket manager was also in trouble. So the NBA commissioner to this day has not said anything. So that, that, this is why I've been keep saying this is on us. This is a problem that we have to deal with. Um, what was the other? It's okay, I think that's okay. okay. Um, I will just reiterate with so many powerful voices that are silent how lucky we are that you are not and the sacrifices that you make to raise your Thank you, I know what I missed. This school deserves a lot of credit, not because I'm sitting here to have a conversation with Stephanie. Many universities in our country has been silenced. They don't, they don't have the willingness, even though some professors, some students feel urged, um, sense the urgency to speak out, the management is not allowing it. And they get uh, money from China. Yes. The, so this is one area, uh, Catholic University in, in Washington uh, officially requested the school to divest from the endowment. Uh, so something similar uh, could happen. Uh, this is not the right venue for me to air this frustration, but vast majority of the law schools, I've been probably spoken at uh, five law schools in the country, but the vast majority of them even silent, even my own alma mater. Thank you for coming here and sharing your voice Thank with you. us. <laughs> Students, um, please go get your complimentary book. Commissioner Turkel will stay after to sign your book and visit with you. Um, and please feel free to get some lunch. We'll see you upstairs.